you have your Bibles, I trust, to open them up to uh, James, and we're in the fourth chapter. We're going to be picking up at verse 11 tonight. Um, we have, in the last week or so, been looking at uh, the fourth chapter where he starts out uh, talking about pride. We, we, we looked for a week at pride and humility and contrasted those. And then how uh, things grow out of that pride. We came back to those first 10 verses and looked at uh, particularly areas like worldliness, uh, idolatry, which is spiritual adultery. And uh, we, we dealt with those areas as well and uh, how they affect our walk with God. Now, part of what I want you to see in these first 10 verses is that those attitudes affect how we walk with God. This section tonight from 11 through 17 talks about areas that affect our walk with others, with people. And so that's part of what we were wanting to kind of distinguish between and then look at, and we'll, we'll start in verse 11. Uh, we're going to look at three areas tonight, and, and it may be a misnomer to use this as a title. I put uh, prejudice, presumption, and omission. And when people hear the word prejudice, they immediately think in terms of what is commonly referred to as racial issues. But that's not where we're headed tonight. Uh, we've, we've talked about that with a lot of, uh, a lot of other topics. Uh, when I talk about prejudice tonight, I'm going to be talking about pre-judging. And that's, uh, that's what James is referring to. And his issue and his examples are not necessarily about other races in that respect. Uh, it could have. We could have some application to that, but, uh, but not completely. There's other areas as well, and we'll just look at those in just a moment. Uh, the three areas that James will deal with tonight, 11 through 17, is how we judge one another, how we plan for the future, and how we miss opportunities to minister. And so I want us to, to kind of look at these three areas, not as unrelated, but as related in the way that we deal with other people. He says, beginning at verse 11, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Now, let me just add right here, he's going back to a conversation that he had in that uh, first chapter when he says to be doers of the word. James says, if you're just a hearer of God's word, and not a doer, one who applies God's word. It's like someone who looks in the mirror, sees something wrong, and then just goes his way and forgets what he looked like. But you didn't. You saw something and you corrected it. James is saying the same thing about the law. He called the, the, the mirror the, in the first chapter the perfect law of liberty, speaking of the word of God as the perfect law of liberty. So when he says the law, he's not talking about the regulations. He's talking about how God governs our lives. And so he makes this statement. He says that when you speak evil of the law and judge the law, if you judge the law, you are, do, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And then he makes the, the application, because these are to the, to the Jews that are scattered abroad. There's only one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, and who are you to judge your brother? And so with that uh, uh, introduction, uh, he begins talking about judgment. And I put the word prejudice because to me the word prejudice means to prejudge, to judge something or someone on the, parent, on, on, on the appearance Primarily, this is why so many times it's, it's looked upon racially. Uh, we, we form our opinions, we, we set them in motion, we, we, we accept them for ourselves because we've already made up our mind and we have judged that either situation or individual based on the, uh, the appearance. And so I put in your notes that prejudge, prejudice is the act of prejudging another and making decisive decisions based strictly on those prejudgments. Jesus said, do not judge according to appearance. 
judge with righteous judgment. The issue James is bringing up is about speaking evil by judging another when that is the role of God, who is the one lawgiver. And so we want to look at this. Uh, we normally, like I say, we normally associate prejudice with racial issues, but they don't have to be racial in nature. Prejudice is found in so many other areas of life. They and it isn't just nationality or culture or language. It can also be found in regards to socioeconomic status. We have preset ideas of what those in poverty are like. And sometimes when they come in, in fact, James deals with this uh, when he was talking, and remember back in chapter 2, when he says, you know, you're, you're, you're partial to some people. Uh, he says, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory with partiality. If there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, you say to him, here, sit here in a good place. You say to a poor man, you stand there, or you sit here at my footstool. We're making distinctions. And James will go on to say, by the way, you're dishonoring the poor man when you do that. And you see, we, 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 we form these lines and then we lump in these areas, and James says, you're prejudging. You're prejudging. The issue that James is bringing up is about speaking evil by judging another and taking away from the role of God, which is the one lawgiver. I put in your handouts what the Bible teaches us about being discerning and not judging. I put in your, your handout the difference between discerning and judging. We know we're not to judge. That's what James is saying. Don't judge. And we talked about this to some degree before, about the difference between judging and discerning. Uh, some, some pastors have made this comment, uh, we're not to judge, but we are to be fruit inspectors. But first of all, discernment is one who discerns, examines themselves before evaluating the activities of others. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28 through 31 says the following, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for he who eats and drinks is in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason we may be weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, and by that it means if we examine ourselves, uh, we would not be judged. Whereas in judgment, one who judges condemns before checking to see if they have similar qualities in their own life. Uh, Jesus talked about the splinter and the beam. He says, you want to you remove a splinter from your brother's eye, but you don't recognize that you have the same thing in your own eye. And that's what Romans 2.1 says, Therefore you're inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, because you, you, you who judge practice the same things. We saw this in, in one of the passages that we looked at this morning when he lists all these sins, and then he says, And, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. The process by which we examine another starts with examining ourselves. You know why that is? Because many times we project our own faults to other people. We see in others what is really a problem in ourselves, but we see it in them first. And so we are quick to want to speak to their issues, not realizing that we may possess the same issues. And so... Discernment calls for us to examine ourselves before we uh, evaluate the activities of others. Secondly, discernment, one who discerns, checks the accuracy of the facts before forming opinions. We talked about this last Sunday. That was one of the primary things that we talked about to avoid misunderstandings is by checking the facts. Check these things out. Because the one who judges, they just form an opinion and, and by the way, let me just go ahead and read that verse. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 just says, Test all things and hold fast what is good. But one who judges forms opinions first and then looks for evidence. John 7.24 says, Do not judge according to appearance. We looked at this one this morning, but judge with righteous judgment. John 7.51 says, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? Check 
the facts before you come to a conclusion. Don't come to a conclusion and then look for facts to try to support it. The third area, he says, one who discerns deals as privately as possible with the problems they see. This was taken from Matthew 18, and we've, we've looked at this passage uh, in detail, where it just simply, and I'll just do the first verse in verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But don't involve other people. Don't be part of that process that shares the details of an offense with those who are not a part of the problem or a part of the solution. When you are discerning, you are dealing as privately as possible. Whereas the one who judges publicly exposes those they condemn through sharing their opinions with those not involved. Luke 6, 37 says, Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. When we judge, we are assuming the responsibility that only belongs to God. And this is, although we are, are dealing with other people, this also affects the way we're responding to God. Because why? God sets himself up. He says, I'm the only judge there is. James is going to mention it here. There's only one lawgiver. In fact, in James 4.12, that's exactly what he says. When he says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? In Romans chapter 14, verse 4, he says, Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master, speaking of God, he stands or falls. Hebrews 10.30, as you can tell, these are just, I've just listed the scriptures for you here. I'm going to share them with you, what they say. And then you can go back and look at them again. Hebrews 10.30 we know him who said, and he quotes the same thing that, that Paul will say in the book of Romans, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Don't put ourselves in that position. And so when we do, we are, we are assuming a responsibility that was never ours. We take on the responsibility that only belongs to God. In the next chapter of James, you'll read him say, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Jesus is coming again. It's all going to be sorted. We don't have to settle those accounts here. We are not to be the judge that makes the decisions of what should, should be done in this such a situation. So that's the sin of, preju of prejudice, in other words, of prejudging others. James then turns his attention to the area of the future. And when he does, he begins with a common scenario that we often talk about, and then even some businesses, they even promote designing a one-year plan based on the best possible outcome. And there's only one problem with that. It presumes upon the future. It assumes that everything is going to go as it is going now. Uh, when I talk to people about credit, I say, this is one of the things you've got to be aware of, that when you engage yourself in personal credit and extend yourself into an area of, of, of debt, you're presuming that everything's going to continue as it's going right now. You're presuming that the job's going to be there or this is going to happen or this is going to happen. And this is what James is saying. He says, verse 13, Come now, you who say tomorrow, or today, or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city. We'll spend a year there. We'll buy and sell, and look what else. We'll make a profit. How many speculations have been brought into to disarray and bankruptcy because they made the presumption that they could go, do, buy, sell, and make a profit. He goes on to say, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? It's even a vapor. It appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. And then he tells us in verse 15 what we ought to say. If the Lord wills. In other words, let's put this back in the hands of the one who knows. If the Lord lives, or excuse me, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. He talks about moving to a new location, starting successful business, buying, selling, and making a profit. This scenario is pitched to investment bankers every day with one problem. 
there's no guarantees. Before you know it, COVID happens and everything changes. So you don't want to presume upon the future and make it dependent on making the same or the more money throughout the time of the loan. So he makes the statement, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Here's what the problem with presumption is. And I put, uh, uh, I put this, I think it's on the back of your sheet. That number one, it causes us to make unwise decisions based on our will and our plans. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. This is what James is saying. You, what you ought to say is if the Lord wills, we'll, go, we'll do this, we'll go here, we'll do that. But everything is contingent upon what the Lord's direction is. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and let Him direct your paths. But the second thing, and I think this is what's also very important for us, is that it takes the control of our future out of God's hands, places it in our own, and that's presumption. Proverbs 27.1 is where so many of the others got this particular statement. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a man may bring forth. And I actually, I, I, I put in bold, you don't know. You don't know what tomorrow might hold. The sin of presumption occurs when we put ourselves in the position of God. What we should do is to acknowledge God where we are, seek to be faithful in where He has placed us, or chooses to send us. In James 4.15, he says, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or do that. James is repeating his appeal for submission. You remember back when earlier when we talked about this uh, before, he, he talked in verse 7. He says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. We were using that to talk about temptation. Last week we talked about worldliness and idolatry, which is spiritual adultery and temptation and how to handle temptation. Well, one of the first things James tells you is to submit yourself to God. And then when you have submitted yourself to God, you're resisting the devil. He'll flee from you. There are those who feel if you pray, and this is sad, there are those good Christian groups who say, but if you pray, if the, if the Lord wills, you're showing doubt. And because you're showing doubt, you're not demonstrating faith. And because you're not demonstrating faith, don't expect to get what you pray for. That's, what, not, that's not what James is teaching us. James is teaching us just the opposite. He's teaching us to pray in everything if the Lord wills. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, and we talked about this when we talked about prayer, says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that if He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of Him, not because it has come from us, but because it has come from Him, because we're praying according to His will. I share with you uh, regularly that prayer is one of those things that begins at the throne of God, is revealed to us, and as we are seeking God's face and knowing how God is leading us, we then pray for Him to take care of what needs to be done for us to get to that point of the will that started at the throne. When we put ourselves in the position of God, we then decide for ourselves what we should do and not do. And that leads us to the third area tonight, the sin of omission. But let's just look at just James for just a moment. Because sins of omission, and that, by the way, is verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's not negligence. That's refusal to do what you've been told to do. The sin of omission is not, well, I just didn't do what I probably should have done thinking it through later and kind of second-guessing yourself, it's not negligence. It's not forgetting to turn the light off as you left the house. It's saying, I ain't turning the light off because I know better. Or I ain't turning the light off because of who told me to turn the light off. It's not negligence. It's refusal. And because it's refusal... You're omitting to do something that you have been told to do. Well, 
what kind of list do we draw from that? Well, I got to thinking about that. I thought, you know, there's a whole, kind, a whole bunch of stuff we could put in there. But why don't we just look at what James said? And so what you have on here is the sin of omission. And uh, before I get to the list, let me just go one more, one more step. Let me talk to you about Matthew for just a second. Let me do this uh, passage from Matthew 21. This is, I think, one of the best illustrations of the sin of omission. Here's what this passage says. It's a parable of two sons. He says, uh, Matthew 21, 28 through 31, What do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and he said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. And afterwards he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. So Jesus asked the question, Which of these two did the will of his father? And the story is simply to illustrate it's not who, who says they will, it's who actually does. Which of the two did the will of the Father? They said to him, the first. And Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots will enter the kingdom of God before you because they are repenting. They may have said at the beginning, we don't want to listen to God, but now they're repenting and their lives are changing. But there are those who say, Oh, we, we will do whatever he says, but then they don't do it. That's the illustration that he is giving about obedience. And that's what the sin of omission is about. It's about obedience. It's the refusal to do what you have been told to do. But then I list for you examples of sin, of omission from James alone. In other words, if we just went back through and looked at some of the passages that James has already said, what are some things that James has already told us that we need to be doing? Well, in chapter 1, he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Failure to follow God's word, that's a sin of omission. You have God's word, but you don't read it. You don't read it, you don't follow it, you don't follow it, you don't complete it. You're neither a hearer nor a doer of the word. You are refusing to do what James has mentioned at the very beginning we need to be doing. How are you handling God's word? Are you just reading it or are you reading it and, and applying it? Second one, James 2, 3 and 4 if there should come into your assembly, did you catch that when I read it earlier? Did you hear that? You know that, that word assembly, that means church. If there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings, fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man of filthy clothes, you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. You say to the poor man, you stand there or sit in my footstool. What is he assuming? He's assuming you're coming to church. He's assuming you're in the assembly. And the writer of Hebrews will say, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. But James is making it clear, when you gather together, don't show partiality. But that tells us that we should be gathering together. A failure to show love to the brothers and sisters in Christ. Or a failure to assemble with God's people. And then thirdly, failure to show love to brothers and sisters in Christ. When we got to the second chapter, we saw that whole passage that dealt with faith and works. But here's one of the things that he mentioned in that passage. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. James has brought this out as part of the teaching. He says, this is what we should be doing. And the question is, are we doing it? And so if we're not, if we're having a failure to show love to brothers and sisters in Christ, we're committing sins of omission, told to do it and then decided not to. Same thing as the follow-up in verses 15 through 17, failure to minister to those in need. If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it is, does not have works, is dead. If you know to minister and you're not doing it, that's a sin of omission. 
because it's a refusal to do what you've been told to do. And then he comes to chapter 3. And there's this whole passage, and we talked about this when we looked at chapter 3, about the taming of the tongue. And he said, this is a real battle. He says in James 3.10, Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brother, my brother, these things ought not to be so. Uh, where is the control over your words? If you're having a failure to control your own words, you're committing sins of omission because you've been told to control your words. Last, uh, uh, last week we talked about temptation. What about the failure to overcome temptation? You say, well, I can't overcome all the temptation. I know that. You know that. It's like the farmer says, uh, I can't keep a bird from flying over my head, but I can keep him from making a nest in my hair. I don't have to, to make it part of who I am and what I do. And if you have a, a struggle to overcome temptation, you need to draw near to God. And when you do, He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. These are just things that James has been telling us all the way up to the point that we're talking about now here in chapter 4. James 5, 16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed because the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. This is just seven areas that just James alone mentions that we need to be giving attention to. That as we look in the mirror, we find out if we're doing the word or not. As we look into the perfect law of liberty and we don't, we don't, try to correct others before we correct ourselves. Prejudice and presumption can cause us to be disobedient in doing the good that we are called upon to do. Going back to the early part of this chapter, it is our own pride or arrogance that sets us on our own course of action. And just as it affected the way we treat God through the worldliness and the spiritual idolatry, it affects how we treat others in our prejudgments, in our presumption, and then also in the things that we just aren't doing. The things that we know we should be doing, but we're not doing. And uh, I will confess to you, this is not an easy message to try to share with anybody because, as, as so many have said before, if I'm pointing, I got four more fingers pointing back at myself. Yeah, we're all in this boat together. And as such, we just need to be encouraging one another and helping one another to deepen our walk with God and to deepen our walk with one another. And where we need to make things right, we just need to make things right. So, let's pray.